TDOS is a framework of web application penetration testing tools, which is useful for going after all sorts of web applications. Today, we'll take a look at all the various tools included in TDOS on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Web applications are everywhere, from major websites controlling services, all the way to IoT devices in your home that allow you to interact and maybe configure the device. Now, for penetration testers or hackers, it's relatively difficult to get all the tools together you need to actively penetrate these devices. There can be tools that exploit one thing, like maybe common passwords. There can be other issues in the website that take a little bit of scanning to find. So running a full scan and doing the whole process from start to finish can really take a lot of time and involves using a lot of different tools. Frameworks are valuable because, like Metasploit, they bring together a whole bunch of tools you would need during a penetration test under one framework and allow you to pick them in phases, automating the workflow and making it a lot more simple to understand what you're supposed to do next. TDOS is just that for web application penetration testing, the same way that some tools like Ergedin bring together a lot of common tools for cracking Wi-Fi. Now, this framework is really useful for anybody interested in web application penetration testing. So if you're interested, instead of going after every single tool and trying to run this uh, kind of cycle of attacking, doing reconnaissance, and doing exploitation yourself, you should try out TDOS and see if it works for whatever it is you want to try doing. Now, to install it, we're going to deviate a little bit from the instructions, because I found there were a couple hiccups when I installed it earlier today. However, in relatively short period of time, you can do a lot of different things all the way from passive scanning up into exploitation. So installing it, while a little bit tricky, is definitely worth it. Now, to install this, I recommend you're running a Linux machine. And while Kali Linux is the most simple, I'm actually running this on Ubuntu, so it runs just fine in other Linux distributions as well. You'll need to be connected to either the internet if you're scanning your remote system or a local area network where you have a device you have permission to exploit if you're going to go up to that. But if you want to just try out the recon modules, you can go ahead and do that on virtually anything. Once you have a Linux computer ready to go and fully updated and you're connected to Wi-Fi or an ethernet connection, then we can begin. To get started with the TDOS framework, the first thing you'll do is go to the GitHub page. Here, you can see some more information about the program, including this nice little logo, and you can learn more about what it's designed to do and the various ways that it's been divided up into uh, five different phases. Now, there's a total of 108 modules, and you can see that this has been really well thought out and developed pretty extensively and was even updated pretty recently, which is actually how I found it, because sometimes I just go on GitHub and look for trending projects in OSINT or other kinds of security categories. It's a great way of finding tools that are trending that you might not have heard of yet. So scrolling down, you can see that there are some official installation instructions that seem pretty straightforward. They don't work, or at least they didn't work for me. And in this case, I am using an Ubuntu system instead of a Kali Linux system. So this might work a lot better on Kali, but you can see that this is actually a pretty straightforward install. Um, but again, you'll need to modify the instructions in order to get it to work. So first you'll need to do a git clone. And you can follow this pretty much exactly the way that you see on the website. You can, in a terminal window, just type git clone and paste it here. And of course here, oops, uh, oops, <laughs> that's twice. Uh, but here you can see that if I run this, I already have a destination because I've downloaded it, but you should be seeing a whole bunch of stuff all being downloaded. So next we'll go ahead and type CD and then go to the framework that we just downloaded, Tito's framework. And if we type LS, then we can see all the things that we've downloaded, which include the actual Python program and some helpful scripts uh, such as uninstall and then some of the installation requirements. So cool. Now we need to do chmod uh, plus x install, which will give us the ability to execute the script. So once we're in this folder, we'll go ahead and run that. And finally, we'll need to do a install. So this is one of the scripts. Ah. This is one of the scripts uh, that's already in the folder. You can see it right here. So we'll need to type sudo and then install. Now 
Now this will go ahead and install and you can see there's even this cute installation and there are some other things you'll need to do in order to get it running. So it'll go ahead and do most of the heavy lifting for you, but if you run into some problems, I'll go through the things that you can do because uh, there are a couple ways I found that generally will solve the problems that this kicks up. Okay, so it says that we're ready to launch it, but that's not totally accurate. While the installation tool is helpful, it does miss a number of libraries that actually you will need to install this. So if you scroll down, you can see that there's also a pip install tac r requirements.txt. So we'll need to make sure that we run this inside the folder. And if you type ls, you should see something called requirements.txt. There we go. So in Python, this is the standard way of including all the libraries that you need. So if we type sudo pip2 install tac r requirements.txt, this will go ahead and take care of most of the libraries, including some that might not have been installed in the previous installation file. Now, we should be ready to go according to the instructions on the website, but in practice, I found that there are still some things that are missing. So to go over that, I wanna show you what I found to kind of help out. So one thing that's important is having this uh, Lead Madrid client 18. Uh, you can type sudo apt install and then just this right here. And generally uh, this will install the first thing that gives you an error if the installation doesn't go normally for you. If there's anything else that's missing, AKA you get a, an error that says that a particular module is missing or a particular library is missing, just type pip install and then the word for you know whatever it says it's missing. In my case, I was missing this library right here. And as soon as I did a pip install and then installed it, I was able to proceed with the program normally. So all in all, a little bit of a rocky installation, but once you have everything together, you can generally just try to do either a pip install or a sudo apt install. But I did find that I got this weird error. Uh, it was, where was it? Import error, uh, can an open shared file, no such file directory. So if you get this error, which was the first thing that I got, make sure to remember that you can just install sudo apt install and then lib madrid client um, right here and you should be able to overcome that problem as well as any other errors you might get. So let's say that you overcome all that and we're ready to get started. So we can just CD to prove that I'm not just running the Python program and it actually is installed all the way and type sudo titos. Go ahead and enlarge that as well. All right, so here we go. We have this nice little entry point where we can see the who developed this and uh, exactly what we're agreeing to. So we're gonna agree to the terms and conditions and they think that's awesome and we're gonna move on. So this looks very similar to uh, Ergedin or some of the other like cool frameworks that integrate a whole bunch of tools. So now we can see what the uh, overall framework looks like and we can select a target web address to begin running these various modules on. So we got to pick someone who really deserves it. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and use Priceline.com, one of the worst companies you can use for booking hotels. Now I'm going to go ahead and enter the website here. And after I press enter, it'll check the server status to make sure that the website is up, grab the IP, and then here we are. We are in the modules section. So when you're doing this sort of penetration testing, it's best to break down the phases into various steps that you're doing. First is reconnaissance and OSINT, where you try to, without being discovered, learn as much as you possibly can about the target. Next is scanning and enumeration. Once you find various parts that could be a potential target, uh, that being servers or web domains or something like that, uh, you can go ahead and scan them and start to learn more about what's behind the initial contact. Next is vulnerability analysis, where we start to identify actual problems or misconfigurations in what we found and break down what's going to be the weakest link for us to attack. Then we have an exploitation module, which is currently in beta, but allows us to actually exploit things that we found that are vulnerable. Finally, we have a series of auxiliary modules, which will basically, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at those, but they're more kind of extensions of what this tool can do. So, uh, I also have noticed that uh, some of the languages in, in here is Hindi, so I'm not totally sure, but I think that the developer might be Indian, but either way, this is a really cool and interesting tool that is very useful for going after a variety of different targets. So now that we've already selected our target and that information is loaded, let's select option one to go into the reconnaissance and OSINT module. 
You can see they're also really into ASCII art, which I am as well. So I really appreciate the fact that they came up with their own individually ASCII screens for all these different modules. So it's important to distinguish passive finger uh, footprinting from active reconnaissance because one of them actually involves kind of going up and touching the target and the other is designed to be totally passive and not present any opportunity for you to be discovered. Now active reson reconnaissance can be interpreted as very suspicious, so we're going to steer away from those and actually focus on passive footprinting for this demonstration because it's something you can use on basically anyone, including Priceline.com. So we'll select number one, which is the passive footprinting, and boom, we get all of these awesome different options that are available for us to uh, kind of assess the target and learn more about it. So we can go through them and I'll show you what just kind of using one uh, looks like. We'll do number one for a ping check and it takes the information we already entered and we don't need to be constantly entering in you know, the same target because it already knows that we, um, that we, we told it to do this. It sends an NMAP, uh, an NPing scan and we can get information about the target um, ooh, like that. So next we can do a GOIP lookup so we can locate where the target actually is uh, and learn more information about where the server that's hosting its website is located. So if we want to go ahead and do everything, then there's another mode we can do called Auto Awesome Module. Uh, you can see it's noted, the description is Unleash the Beast, which is not very descriptive, but basically it goes through every single one of these modules and automates them. So it's just kind of one thing that, that does all of them at the same time. Now this is available for uh, most of the different modules. So if you want to try out uh, everything in the next module as well, you can use the Auto Awesome module. So I'm going to go ahead and type A and it's gonna go ahead and run through all the different passive modules so we can basically gather as much information without actually interacting with the target as possible because the point of this is that we you know, don't have any direct contact. We can run the same thing on the active one and we'll probably actually leave some, log, some uh, fingerprints in the log, but since we're just going to be simulating normal activity, that's not too much of a problem. Already we can see we're starting to get subnet class information, uh, we're looking up reverse DNS information, we're getting the uh, DNS IP address, and then here we're also looking at the IP uh, history, so we can learn more information about past domains and uh, kind of dig through what might have been there before this particular scan. So we'll let this run through and periodically we'll get more little bursts of information, but generally it will ask us a couple times for more input if the module needs a little bit more, but we don't need to install any API keys or anything fancy because this is just running without requiring us to log into a service. Now we will need to provide some input. In this case, I'm going to limit the search result because it's just gonna be doing a Google search for other websites with information relating back to Priceline uh, to maybe 10 pages of results. Now the interesting thing about this tool is it doesn't just look at the current state of the website we target, it also looks at past dates as well. So I'm going to go ahead and pull in versions of the Priceline website available in 2005 all the way through 2006. And I'll limit the results to 10. Now I'll assume that they're using at Priceline.com. Now it's worth pointing out that if you're running this on a slow internet connection, this module can take a really long time to run if you choose the auto uh, awesome option. Now, when we just ran this on slow internet, it took almost 25 to 30 minutes just to go through all the various options. So make sure that you do this on relatively fast internet if you're gonna run absolutely everything because you could be sitting here for quite some time. Now, if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that some of the services like Census we were using actually require an API key. And fortunately, the author has gone through and scraped for API keys, which means that you don't need to sign up for anything or add anything in order to use this awesome tool. Now we can go back to the passive recon module and now that we've run literally every single thing we could using the auto awesome module, we can type 99 to go back. Now I'm not going to sit through going through another entire module, but if we want to go to section two, which is the active reconnaissance, we can take a look at some of the tools that are available and see we get more direct pinging, grabbing HTTP headers, scraping comments from web pages, 
Uh, we can do CMS detection, find alternative sites, and enumerate the servers behind the website as well. We can even do common file brute forcing, which doesn't mean we're actually breaking in, it just means that we're brute forcing for common file names that might be stored on their server. So if we go back, we can see that uh, there's also the information disclosure module, which we can take a look at here. And this is more for kind of figuring out if there's been stuff already out there, credit card leaks, uh, phone number leaks, any internal IP addresses, even social security numbers are included in this module, which is pretty remarkable. So if we go back even further, then we can take a look at the other available modules besides reconnaissance. We can see for scanning and, and enumeration, we don't differentiate between active and passive. And instead we have everything from the web application firewall enumeration, port scanning and analysis, and then we can also let loose crawlers on the target, um, which will scan to a different level of depth depending on which you want to set. So this is all pretty powerful and is also more direct than the previous options because we'll actually be interacting directly with the target. Now from there, we can move on to number three, which is the vulnerability analysis, as you can see from this giant crosshairs, and contains everything from basic bugs and misconfigurations, maybe uh, low priority things like passwords set to default configuration, something like that, and then critical vulnerabilities, as well as other brute force options. Now we can also take a look at one module that's in beta, which is the exploitation module. So the exploitation module is uh, currently only including Shellshock, but if we do identify something that has this vulnerability, then we can actually uh, execute the exploit within this module as well. Now I'm gonna go back and we'll take a look at the final set of modules, which is the auxiliary module. And here we can see that we can generate hashes from strings, we can encode payloads or strings, we can pull metadata from images. So if we maybe have an image that had uh, like a geolocation encoded or something like that, we can extract that here. And then we can also start to basically look and see what the probability of something being a honeypot is. Now together, all these tools represent an incredibly useful toolkit for anybody interested in web application penetration testing. So you can check them out on your own because some of them really do take a long time to run, but they all are really effective against various targets when you're dealing with web applications. Because TDOS is such a versatile tool, you really need to be careful about the targets that you select. Now you can run this against anything from a router where you have complete permission to run anything you want, up into a remote website where you definitely don't. So for some of the modules, like the recon modules that are completely passive, you can feel free to run this against anything and it's going to be useful no matter what. But the exploitation module, while useful, definitely should not be run against a website that you don't have permission. So make sure when you're running it that you're choosing carefully because this is one of those scripts where choosing the wrong button if you don't know what you're doing could get you in trouble. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts or feedback on the show, you can leave a comment on the Null Byte article, or you can go ahead and leave me a comment on my Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.